So thank you very much to the organizers for uh, inviting me to give this talk today. I will be talking about global anti-cancer drug discovery and development trends and how Eurofins as a CRO organization can help you with your drug discovery programs. What we'll cover today is aspects of drug discovery and development in a general overview, some of the activities that are required to discover a new drug and to take it through into clinical development. We'll discuss some of the current trends in oncology and in fact the impact that COVID-19 has had on drug discovery, but also some of the longer reaching impact that it may have going forward. We'll also discuss driving success in oncology therapeutic development and how we as a CRO can actually help your, your drug discovery programs. And then lastly, we'll delve into looking at how to develop safer, more effective drugs. So to start with, looking at drug discovery and development. Drug discovery really over the last 10 to 20 years has actually increased tremendously in cost. In fact, over the last 10 years, we've seen a 145% increase in the cost of drug discovery. Part of the problem with this is that a lot of the decisions are made and they're made in a very inefficient manner. Uh, drug discovery is a very arduous process from very early R&D right the way through to selecting a preclinical candidate. And in fact, when one selects a candidate, the game isn't over then because one goes into clinical development and that can be quite risky if the, the work that has been done in drug discovery is not uh, predictive of what one might see in a translational sense. So early development and preclinical approaches often have poor relevance to human disease biology. So if one can actually address that and, and use better models, then the chance of success is a lot higher. When we really look at the success rate of, of oncology drug discovery, in fact, this drug discovery across all therapeutic areas, the re return on investment is actually less than 12%. So that's not a very good return there. In fact, when one considers that from initial drug discovery program establishment, typically around one in 15 programs actually makes it into clinical development as well. So that the generally the success rate is relatively low. So we have to look at ways of improving that. When we look at drug discovery though, when we in, in particular uh, across the, the, the recent years, we see that there has been an increase in the number of approvals. And we can see that in this chart. So really at all levels, when we're looking at new molecular entities or NMEs, there are high points and low points, but there has generally been a slight trend upwards. And this really has been noticed with the impact of biologics really in the last 10 years. We've seen a tremendous increase in the number of biologics approved. And in part that has been driven from the oncology perspective by the approval of immuno-oncology agents, things like pembrolizumab, nivolumab, and so, so forth. So this has obviously helped drive the number of new molecular entities that have been brought to market. So definitely drug discovery is on a growth phase and how can we manifest that from the oncology perspective? When we look at drug discovery from a stepwise perspective, there are different phases. There's early drug discovery, typically where one is looking at target validation, one may also be looking at association of uh, a disease with a particular target in, as part of that validation, or identifying whether a particular target is tractable. Uh, in many years, people have considered certain target classes as untractable, but as technologies have advanced and capabilities have improved, that has been proven not to be the case. For example, kinases have been a very uh, important target in oncology over the last uh, 20, 30 years, for example. But initially they were thought to be untractable. We currently find ourselves at, at a place where we are looking at new target classes as part of the goal of finding newer, more efficacious and better medicines. One then goes through a process of hit finding. So that might typically be following a screen, but then identifying chemical series in the case of small molecules or hits that are potentially developable or optimizable. That goes then into lead optimization, where really those hits are developed a lot more. They are characterized more thoroughly, and those leads are then ultimately considered the best leads, at least, for taking forward into preclinical development. So these are really the very best drugs that, that one might be looking to take forward into a clinical trial. 
Now, ways, <coughs> excuse me, ways in which a CRO can uh, help with the uh, process here of drug discovery are numerous. We have a lot of state-of-the-art equipment. In certain cases, there are technologies that are not always available to smaller companies. Uh, we have a significant state-of-the-art equipment across the, uh, the CRO uh, capabilities that we offer. We have a lot of speciality platforms. Uh, examples of those are shown here. Kinome Scan is one of the platforms that we offer that assists with kinase drug discovery. We have a, a platform, a very elegant translational platform called Biomap. And I'll talk a little bit more about that in more detail, but this is a very powerful platform in making that bridge between drug discovery and clinical relevance from a translational perspective. We have other specialist platforms such as Oncopanel, which is an in vitro cellular phenotypic platform, in which case, in, in which we can evaluate uh, cancer drugs to see their direct anti-cancer activity. We also have translationally relevant solutions, and this is a very important step. Too often the process of drug discovery is based on assays that while they are target directed, may have very little translational, potentially clinical relevance. So incorporating translationally relevant solutions into the drug discovery pathway is very important, and especially if that is done at earlier phases. We have significant scientific and regulatory expertise. So a lot of the people within the CRO world have themselves had experience working in drug discovery teams and leading drug discovery teams prior to coming to, to work for the CROs. So we have significant experience there that can actually help overcome some of the roadblocks that one might see in drug discovery. We also have committed staffing, so we can actually uh, build operations and uh, put together assay platforms or assay processes that can assist with drug discovery here. And we can do this for both small molecules and biologics and a range of other therapeutic modalities. So we're not restricted just to these specific therapeutic modalities. So if we now take a look at current trends from the oncology perspective, in drug discovery, oncology has often over the last several years been a leader in terms of investment. So that's investment not only at the level of pharmaceutical companies that recognize the tremendous un unmet need of oncology drugs, but also from government and other funding agencies. Oncology still remains a highly unmet medical need, and as such, there is tremendous investment in that. So we see that here in terms of, the, of oncology having greater investment than other therapeutic areas. That doesn't mean to say that it's any more or less important than those, but there is the recognition that oncology presents a tremendous unmet medical need for which we need better, more efficacious and safer medicines. This is also shown in this particular slide where when you look at different therapeutic areas here on the left, and you can see the compound annual growth rate in terms of um, drug discovery services that are offered, there is a very similar growth rate here across really all of the therapeutic areas. And that recognizes that identification of new drugs in these therapeutic areas are all important. However, the investment in terms of an absolute number is consistently high for oncology. Again, coming back to the fact that oncology is still a big killer worldwide, and that in many cases, there are unmet medical needs from the perspective of not only some of the niche cancers, but even some of the larger cancers where, for example, existing therapies can sometimes result in resistance and thus potentially a new subset of that disease needs to be treated. And thus that requires new therapeutic approaches. If we look at the 2020 regulatory snapshot, and this shows approvals in the European theater, as well as in the uh, United States with the FDA, you can see that all of all approvals here, either in Europe or in America, the anti-cancer drugs represent more than 50% in both cases. So this is not only a reflection of that importance of developing new drugs in that particular therapeutic area, but also of the relative success that we have achieved in doing so. In fact, also another important number here are the number of new active anti-cancer substances. And what this means are new drugs that are either targeting new molecular targets 
or they are new modalities and ways of therapeutically approaching cancer. As I've mentioned, in recent years, one of the biggest trends has been the increase in adoption of immunotherapeutic agents, not so much direct anti-cancer agents, but agents that nonetheless harness the human immune system to unmask tumors and restore the capability of the immune system to recognize tumors and destroy tumor cells. So you can see from this that oncology remains a very important component of all of therapeutic drug discovery. And we are making progress as a general uh, industry and science in developing new medications that, that are providing newer ways to attack and to treat this disease or collection of diseases. On the right hand side here, I just want to draw your attention very quickly to the different therapeutic modalities and approvals. Um, in particular, chemotherapies and small molecules still remain strong. That's not to say that immunotherapies uh, have taken over the, uh, the, the drug discovery world. They certainly provided significant impetus and success, but small molecule therapies still remain a very strong and viable way of developing anti-cancer drugs. And in fact, ultimately, combinations between immunotherapy modalities and small molecules or other agents, such as some of the improved chemotherapies, can provide tremendous benefit in combination therapeutics. If one looks at global cancer prevalence, I'm sure we've seen this slide many times, but we see some of the cancers that, that we, we recognize as being the, the major cancers in the oncology world. For example, lung cancer. A lot of the medications that have been developed over recent years, including some of the immuno-oncology agents and improved second and third generation EGF receptor inhibitors are designed with lung cancer and other cancers in mind. Now, these obviously represent higher mortality cancers. And this reinforces the notion of there being an unmet medical need in these cases. Uh, the drug discovery world has to do a better job of developing medicines faster developing better medicines and safer medicines. The safer the medicines are, the more likely they potentially can be used in combination with other agents to provide even greater impact in treating these diseases. We then go through some of the other major types, such as colorectal cancer and prostate cancer, towards those that are of greater and highest prevalence. So again, when one looks at a lot of the newer drugs that have been approved for treatment of, in this case, breast cancer, we see that reflected in things like the CDK4 and CDK6 inhibitors, as well as some of the other agents that are now, now on the market to treat breast cancer. So collectively, an unmet medical need, but for different reasons. I, either there are high prevalence or incidences of the cancer, or very, very high mortality rates. Now, that's not to say that we should forget these other cancers that are perhaps lower on the scale. They are all important. And in fact, there are many, many drug discovery programs that are designed to treat each of these different cancers and many that I'm not showing on this slide. So collectively, there is a, a lot of work to address different types of cancer. And in fact, some of the tumor, some of the molecular targets in these less well represented tumors can cross over into some of these larger cancers. For example, agents that are developed to treat some of these particular cancers may also have application in some of these bigger cancers. If we now take a moment to think about COVID-19, I, I think it's fair to say that everybody has been affected around the world by COVID-19 over the last year and a half. And the question then is, has that had an effect on dr oncology drug discovery or the need for new and better oncology medications? So if we look at the number of uh, candidates, oncology candidates in active research programs over the last 15 years, we see that there was in fact actually quite an increase since 2014 in the number of new programs. And this is really true around the world, re regardless of, of where you are located. Unfortunately, with COVID-19 and the SARS-CoV-2 virus taking the world by grip in 2020, we saw a decrease, a significant decrease in all cases where drug discovery um, uh, programs and active research programs uh, were actually diminished. Part of that was because uh, researchers couldn't get into their labs. Part of it was because of diverted funding and uh, resources looking at treating 
uh, the SARS-CoV-2 virus or anti or developing better anti-inflammatory agents to treat some of the symptoms that are related with COVID-19 disease. Now, if we look, unfortunately, at another aspect of COVID-19, we see the, this particular picture. Because there was isolation and the need to quarantine, but also an inherent fear and, and an understandable fear, given how little was known about COVID-19, in people going out and getting preventive screenings, for example, mammograms with breast cancer, pap smears in pap tests in, in cervical cancer, colonoscopies, and even CT scans for lung. You can see in all cases, there was a decrease in the number of people that went to have those predictive and um, uh, prevent, uh, um, the diagnostic type screenings. And so what we speculate then is that because of this, there will be a lot of cases that were actually missed um, or not caught early enough. So we are speculating then that there will be an increase in the number of patients in these, these various cancers. Remember, I was saying that breast cancer is one of the most prevalent cancers. So the number of predicted new patients as a result of missing these preventive screenings um, will be significant over the years to come. As a result, we think that that may actually result in increased spending and increased investment in oncology drug discovery to get it back to where it was pre-COVID-19. As a result, that then requires much greater efforts to get more efficacious and safer drugs to market to treat patients anyway, but also these increased number of patients that unfortunately we think we may see over coming years. If we now take a, a moment to turn towards driving success in oncology drug discovery and development, what can we do to actually help make that happen a lot quicker and a lot more effectively? So if we look at what uh, the different CROs and, and, and different uh, companies that offer services can do, we have a spectrum like this. Now, Eurofins currently stands at the top right here, so we have uh, a, a lot more capabilities and uh, in a, being in a leadership position in terms of offering services. Now, that's not to say that any one of these other CROs is inferior. They all have uh, very valid services to offer in their own right. In fact, some of the services that are offered by these CROs are very niche services, so they fit a very specific need. But what we strive for, and I think it's fair to say that all of the, the CROs that, that are uh, in the business of supporting drug discovery uh, strive for is high quality data and scientific excellence. If we don't provide good solutions, then that undermines that need for developing anti-cancer drugs in a more efficacious and a more expedited manner. Obviously, from, from the perspective of working with CROs, there is a confidentiality perspective. Uh, every project that we deal with is, is treated with the utmost of confidentiality, because at the end of the day, one has to still remember that, that drug discovery companies uh, are businesses in their own right. So they, they do want to be able to develop good drugs, but there is a confidentiality need for their projects. As I've mentioned, we do have the ability to provide expert guidance, and that's again true of all of these, these CROs. Now, we can provide expert guidance at many levels. We have expertise in a variety of, of different assay platforms, different therapeutic approaches, and a number of people in the, the CRO world also have direct experience uh, working in pharma drug discovery themselves. I myself, uh, before coming to Eurofin, spent much of my career in big pharma drug discovery. So there's a tremendous wealth of expertise and guidance that can be offered by CROs to improve and enhance the drug discovery process. There's also a, a, an important need to be transparent in communicating uh, on program success. And what I mean by that is getting the data out to our clients, others yourselves, and to do that in a clear and seamless manner and to show how programs are moving forward so that good decisions can be made and to take the drug uh, program to the next step in as rapid and as uh, reliable a manner as possible. And one of the most important things here also is the fact that, that one can provide data-driven dri insights. And ultimately, one, one thinks of uh, biologics license application or investigational new drug uh, applications. One needs scientific data to show why an agency would want to take that, a, that, that particular drug 
into a clinical uh, testing environment. So one needs to be able to provide evidence to show that those drugs in in vitro models and in preclinical in vivo models do work in the way that they are designed to do so to, to to treat the disease and that they are safe and that they are really the best that they can be as they go into clinical testing if we look at what services eurofins can provide we can provide services across a range of global sites we have um, particular sites in eurofins discovery in europe in asia in the United States, and we can provide a wide range of different services, different assays, and different products that can meet various aspects of the drug discovery need. We can conduct model development. In certain cases, there may be assays that are not in existence. So we often do work with our clients to develop models that specifically meet the requirements of a drug discovery program. There is, in some cases, the ability to collaborate. And really, it's fair to say that in all of the programs that we support, we collaborate at one level or another, whether that's providing expertise, interpretation of data, or in the development of new models. As I mentioned, we can provide scientific guidance, uh, both to our clients, but also to operations, so that we perform a much better, more efficient job that ultimately helps you. We can perform uh, portfolio direction and proposal preparation. So in cases where there may not necessarily be experience in putting together a drug discovery program or a series of assays that are designed to identify the best drugs, we have the expertise to be able to do that. One of the most important things, and this comes back to communication and transparency, are data delivery calls and technical report reviews. As I mentioned, we have a lot of experts, both in the drug discovery field and in the technical field, the assay field. And so we can and do provide the ability to go through the, the, the data from any given study with our clients to inform them on what the data mean and what potentially the next best steps might be. Many of the assays and services we provide are IND enabling. So again, this is getting towards providing a package of data that enables a, uh, a drug to be taken forward into clinical testing. And then there are other things. We're all scientists and, and we all recognize the need to, uh, publicate, uh, to, to uh, publish data in certain cases. So we can provide and often do provide data to our clients in publication ready format, uh, as well as uh, contributions to patents. In fact, we have quite a significant uh, ability in, in chemistry. So. Uh, we can synthesize compounds that, that might meet, meet patent needs uh, and can profile them in a variety of assays across our portfolio. As I mentioned, we can really help at just about every step of drug discovery. And I'm not really going to go into great detail on any one of these bullets, but we can fulfill things like biomarker evaluation for early drug discovery and some of the target validation type studies that might be needed. We can use a variety of technologies to do that. We can support high throughput screening. We can evaluate how compounds or therapeutics are acting, or the mechanism of action at their target, or if their target is not known to try and identify that mechanism of action. We can perform significant uh, services around lead optimization, both, as I've mentioned, in terms of synthetic and medicinal chemistry, but also in terms of a whole wealth of different assays and services that not only help monitor and uh, provide uh, SAR information to develop better drugs as part of that optimization process, but also to more fully understand what those drugs are doing, with the goal ultimately to understanding what they will do in the therapeutic environment. We can also, from that angle, provide preclinical resources. We can provide things like candidate scale up for small molecules, and in fact, now also are getting more involved with biologics, with the increase in biologic therapeutics, not only in oncology, but in many therapeutic areas as well. It's important before going into clinical studies that the full toxicity uh, um, signature is known, um, because that can otherwise be a, a showstopper in terms of um, premature termination of a program in clinical testing. So we can perform uh, toxicity and signature type analyses, as well as a variety of other different analyses that get to better understanding how an agent might behave when it goes into a human being. A key one for biologics, of course, is immunogenicity. 
Um, it might be a very good potential biologic, whether it's a monoclonal antibody or a peptide drug, and works very well in some of these other assays. But if it has the potential to cause an immunogenic response, a cytokine storm, we heard a lot of that uh, last year with, with uh, COVID-19, uh, that will not be a good drug. So addressing these kinds of things are just as important as developing an agent that is efficacious and that actually uh, modulates the target in question for the disease uh, that is being uh, addressed. Now, in terms of some of the specific platforms, I, I'm not going to go through every platform we have, but some that are, are more relevant to oncology drug, drug discovery. We have a platform called Pathhunter, and Pathhunter uses a proprietary technology called enzyme fragment complementation. So two fragments of an enzyme will actually come together when those two different fragments are able to do so. And that may be because they are either on different proteins or that uh, the, the one fragment is isolated in a certain part of the cell. And for example, when the cell is killed, uh, that fragment then is available to the, uh, the, the supernatant outside where the other fragment comes into contact and creates a signal. So with this, we can actually put together and we have a wide portfolio of assays to address a variety of different targets in a Pathhunter assay. And I'm just showing on the, the right hand side here, a couple of, of uh, graphs to show in the top right, showing how we can look at small molecules in, in molecule inhibitors of checkpoints. So you can see here that we, we have uh, applications that are relevant to immuno-oncology, as well as a variety of other signal transduction and protein-protein interactions, but also that these assays are highly robust. So this is shown here in the right, uh, bottom right hand side, where we're looking at this particular example for a PD-1 signaling assay. So this is actually a, an N of three runs that are actually super, uh, superimposed upon each other. So highly reproducible uh, assay platforms. As I've mentioned here in, in some of the middle bullet points, uh, we have a variety of different applications of these pathfinder assays, but collectively what they represent are what we call mechanistic assays. They show whether a particular drug is acting on its target. Uh, in, in a, uh, a cellular sense. So, for example, I've mentioned that, that kinases have long been a popular target for oncology. There are a wide number of oncogenic uh, kinases uh, that are, are very viable targets for oncology drug discovery. So we have assays to address that. We have assays, as I've mentioned, to evaluate the effect of immuno-oncology agents. In relatively recent years, there's been a resurgence of interest in nuclear hormone receptors, uh, in particular uh, androgen receptors for uh, uh, treating prostate cancer, um, but also other applications of nuclear hormone receptors. So we have assays to meet that need. Basically, wherever there is emerging medical need from the fundamental of a cancer type, um, that may di dictate the target types that are being addressed. And with those target types, if we don't have existing assays, we're always developing new assays that can then meet the need for drug discovery in those areas. Now, lastly, we also have aspects of Pathhunter that can be used for pathway screening and profiling. So collectively, these help to understand how a drug is working in a cellular environment that shows a step beyond the straightforward biochemical type assays that we typically use in early stages of drug discovery. So this is a, a very valuable tool in understanding how an agent works within a cellular context. If we look at some of the other platforms we have, I've mentioned uh, kinases uh, having been a, 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 a long time uh, popular and, and uh, relevant target class for oncology drug discovery. We have a couple of different platforms to evaluate kinase inhibitors. A kinome scan platform uh, looks at the binding of inhibitors to kinases. So one can see then uh, different aspects of how a drug works from things like quantification of the KB or the binding constant. We can look at potency and selectivity. We have a wide range of kinases represented in this platform. So not only can we look at potency, we can look at selectivity. And this is a very rapid screen. So this is amenable to higher throughput type assays. Now, in addition to binding, we can also look at enzymatic activity or the effect of agents on enzymatic activity. And similarly, we have a very large number of, of kinases represented in this platform. 
And this is a biochemical platform that looks at the effect of test agents on the kinase enzyme activity. So in these cases, one might be looking at in inhibition, for example, in an ATP competitive manner or in other manners. And that can be modeled in, in some of these assays to identify potencies from the activity perspective. Of course, there are different advantages to each platform. For example, kinone scan can uh, potentially evaluate uh, interrupters that, that disrupt the interaction of kinases with other agents, it may, or with other partners, and it may not necessarily be their direct substrate. Kinase profiler, as I mentioned, is more of an activity base, but collectively between the two, the two platforms provide highly complementary approaches to fully characterizing how kinase uh, drugs could, could work. Just mentioned a little bit here about kinome scan. This is a, a more in-depth view of kinome scan. So um, it is a, like I said, a medium to, to high throughput uh, format that uses a qPCR readout. And I'm not going to go into great details to the uh, specifics here, but uh, this is a, a very valuable platform that can evaluate the effect of uh, or the binding of agents to a wide variety of kinases. Now, one thing that's important to, to remember about this, but also the kinase, uh, the kinase profiler platform, and unfortunately with oncology drug discovery, is while there are certain kinases that are mutated in cancer or overexpressed in cancer, with a lot of the kinase inhibitors, prolonged treatment often leads to the generation of resistance mechanisms. And one of those longer term resistance mechanisms is the occurrence of mutations that get around binding of the drug in question. So those then effectively present new targets, even though the, the kinase itself may be the same target that was originally the um, uh, uh, approach with the drug. A good example of that are the EGF receptor inhibitors. So the first generation EGF receptor inhibitors, uh, allotinib, gefitinib, and things like that, uh, were uh, or are uh, ATP competitive kinase inhibitors. But with their use, we have seen the emergence of other mutations that render those drugs inactive. So there has been a lot of work there to identify drugs that bind better or bind to the mutants that are generated as a result of prolonged exposure to those drugs. With the kinase profiler platform, we can also look at some of the more uh, challenging kinases. For example, the, the um, phosphoinositol kinase kinases and lipid kinases. Uh, ATM and ATR and, and DNAPK have long been very challenging targets from the perspective of developing assays. So this is a good example of where working with the CRO and the CRO bringing to bear all of their technological capabilities and expertise is able to provide assays for some of the more challenging targets. And these themselves are attractive targets from an oncology drug discovery perspective. We also offer a variety of services that while not specifically dedicated to oncology drug discovery are still an important part of oncology drug discovery. As I've mentioned, we provide assays in a variety of different areas that look at different target classes. I've mentioned kinases, I've mentioned uh, looking at, at particular pathway inhibitors. Um, we have things to look at uh, protax and, and some of the other emerging modalities. But ADME and toxicology solutions, ADME standing for absorption, distribution, metabolism and excretion of drugs, uh, are important activities to integrate with any drug discovery program. And not only these, but also aspects of safety pharmacology. And we provide services really across all of those aspects of drug discovery, whether you're pursuing an oncology drug discovery program or something for information or neurology. But uh, we, we provide a wide and comprehensive uh, spectrum of different uh, uh, assays that can support drug discovery from that perspective. So if we now take a look at one of the uh, aspects of oncology drug discovery that I've mentioned earlier, and that is the importance of maintaining translational insights. It's very important to not lose track of the fact that one is ultimately trying to develop a drug that will work in the complexity of the human body. And the better we can model aspects of that biology earlier in the drug discovery process, and in a way that is relevant to, trans, to, to clinical studies, 
the greater the chance will be of clinical success when that agent is ultimately taken into clinical trials. So there are certain approaches that we can uh, uh, adopt that can help enable quick win, or in fact, what we call fast fail outcomes. Um, quick wins, obviously everybody likes those, but fast fail is a very important part of the equation. Because if a drug is ultimately not going to succeed when it goes into clinical trials, it's actually better to find that out earlier in the drug discovery process. It saves a lot of time and money in investment in clinical trials, but it also can happen early enough such that uh, adaptations in the program can be made. Ultimately, this kind of analysis can be used, and we do use routinely as drug discoverers, um, in the lead optimization phase. There are certain chemical series that might be ruled out, or there are uh, individual compounds that as we go through lead optimization, we fail. So why wouldn't we do that from the perspective of not only efficacy, but also safety? And that can obviously reduce attrition and improve the quality of candidates going into clinical trials. That's really summarized here. So we can obviously um, provide activity and services relating to all of these different aspects. I've talked about some of the assays that can look at mechanism of action and how we can use assays earlier, some of those kinase assays, for example, um, for triaging hits and looking at undesirable mechanisms. For example, selectivity screening, uh, ruling out hits that, that inhibit kinases that would otherwise be toxic, as an example. Um, we can put in place models and we have models to look at disease validation. This can be done early and this can be done a little bit later, especially for um, more novel associations there. Um, as I've mentioned, we can look at safety assessment. Obviously, that's very important in clinical development or preclinical pre development, but it's also important to address that earlier. But the most important gap really is that translational gap. As I said at the start of the talk, a lot of the assays that we do, while they are good assays in their own right, they may not necessarily have the level of information that provides a translational ability to predict what might happen in a clinical scenario. And that translational gap is comprised of a number of different aspects. Knowing a mechanism and how an agent is working, uh, it might be uh, an agent that modulates a specific target, but it may also have polypharmacology. Adoption of phenotypic processes is also an important way of establishing translational ability to fill this gap. Uh, phenotypic screening, obviously, over the last uh, several years has become more of an important way of actually evaluating uh, drugs as they go forward. But the translational uh, side to things is very important in, ma in maintaining that success of going from a preclinical development into a clinical environment. Some of the assays that one might look at, this is just an example of, of a phenotypic assay that is used uh, in a safety, uh, in a toxicology perspective, is looking at um, micronucleus. So the formation of micronuclei is obviously an undesirable phenotypic effect. And this is something that we can screen for. There are obviously a wide variety of other assays that one can put in place, but this is just an example of one of the assay types that we would use. Now, one of the most important things when developing oncology drugs is understanding human disease biology and modeling it better in vitro. Now, we obviously have a number of standard assays that have been in use for years, but how can we put in place methods and assays that provide a better chance of success in a clinical environment by more accurately and translationally predicting the effect of those agents in in vitro assays? So. You know, we have a variety of, uh, of uh, platforms, in particular the Biomap platform, that looks at uh, primary cell types. These are freshly isolated from human tissues, and they model a variety of different uh, human disease states and different, different tissue biologies. As a result, those cells, because they come from primary sources, are not adapted or changed in the way that they, they live uh, when grown on plastic. Um, to that extent, they, they, from a molecular sense, they remember where they come from. So they model disease a lot more accurately. And they maintain their regulatory mechanisms, pathways, and really the fundamentals of cell biology that make them what they are. So this provides a good way of actually modeling human disease going forward. We can integrate a number of uh, approaches. So that's not to say that we shouldn't use some of the other approaches. 
For example, here looking at EGF tar uh, receptor targeted lesions, we have functional assays. I've mentioned things like the Pathfinder assay. Uh, we have phenotypic assays to look at specific effects of these drugs on the inhibition of tumor cell viability or growth. And in fact, here I'm showing Loplatinib, which is uh, not only an EGF receptor, but a dual EGF HER2 receptor inhibitor. We have the uh, killer platform. We can look at aspects of things like ADCC. So for things like cetuximab and other antibodies where one is taking advantage of bringing in killer T cells uh, to destroy the cancer cells, we can evaluate things like that. I've mentioned the biomap platform. We can use that to model more detailed uh, tissue biology. And ultimately this can be coupled with looking at in vivo models to provide a comprehensive package of fully understanding what an agent does, both in terms of in vitro models but in, in rodent models of disease before going into a clinical scenario. I've mentioned briefly the, onco the Oncopanel platform. This is uh, an in vitro cellular phenotypic platform that is designed to look directly at anti-cancer agents. So we can look at things like viability or proliferation of tumor cells, and we can generate translational data from this. We can correlate drug response data of a wide range of human tumor cell lines with their genomic characteristics, ultimately to, to identify things like predictive genomic biomarkers. So we've all seen the, the development of clinical trials from uh, former models where there were all comers that were treated, uh, ultimately then to streamlining clinical trials where patients really are selected for particular genomic aberrations, where it is felt that a particular medicine may actually have a better response. So we can provide data from the in vitro screening in something like Oncopanel, correlate that with drug uh, with, with genomic aberrations in human tumor cells, and potentially identify genomic factors that may be determinants in suggesting whether a particular patient and their tumor might have a better response to that drug or not. So that has tremendous potential power in helping to not only accelerate, but improve the chances of success of uh, an oncology uh, agent, a therapeutic agent. I mentioned the tremendous growth of the immune system and immuno-oncology over recent years. So the immune system does play a significant role in, in cancer, um, as we've seen by immune suppression or the tumor cells getting away from the, the body's uh, ability to identify them and destroy them. So we have a number of platforms. I've mentioned the Biomap platform, but we also have uh, an extensive biomarker services capability. So with the evaluation of agents that not only directly um, inhibit the growth of tumor cells or inhibit their viability, we have been targeting in recent years the immune system to improve the ability of the immune system to recognize cancers that have otherwise developed mechanisms to evade the immune system. So collectively, between some of our oncology models in Biomap, where we're culturing, co-culturing human tumor cells with cell types that are represented in this, either the stromal matrix, so PBMCs, for example, and fibroblasts, or in the vascular component of the tumor. We must not lose, fact, uh, lose sight of the fact that the vascular component is also an important part of maintaining tumor viability. We can model aspects of that disease from the tumor microenvironment, uh, but also we can look at the effects on the immune system from a range of different biomarkers. So in, in, this is just showing here on the right where uh, when we we're looking at pembrolizumab, there is actually a restored ability uh, of the immune system to identify the cancer. Um, it's often a, a big misconception that immuno-oncology agents increase the activity of T cells. They don't really. Uh, they, they simply unmask the tumor cells and it, restore that immune response. When we focus on the immuno part of immuno oncology, we have a number of different assays to look at things like toll-like receptors or activity at specific immune cell types. Again, this is an extension of the biomarker services platform. And this can be important in driving different aspects of immuno oncology. A lot of people uh, these days now are looking at things like TLRs as potentially attractive targets in oncology drug discovery. The STING pathway has gone through uh, processes of uh, tremendous interest and then um, relative levels of, of disinterest. And then it comes back again as a potentially uh, 
useful uh, pathway to target for immunology aspects. Obviously, for any agent that might modulate the immune system, there is always the risk of the cytokine storm assay, so we can probe for things like that. And we can also look at what is going on in different immune cell types. So we can ask, does a particular agent modulate the effect of T cells, or does it modulate the effect of monocytes? So we can understand a lot more about how immuno-oncology agents are working by looking at the immune system itself. As I've mentioned with the Biomap platform, not only can we look at immuno-oncology agents, but we can also look in the, in the, the tumor microenvironment models, how combinations of immuno-oncology agents with other agents, such as cytotoxics, for example, paclitaxel, uh, can provide even more benefit. So this actually just shows schematically, how, or shows from, from a, a, a data overview, how a combination of paclitaxel and pembrolizumab provide tremendous benefit in restoring uh, the, the immune response, whereas um, these two agents at the bottom here do not. So we can actually explore combinations in Biomap, and, and in fact, also in the Oncopanel platform, where we're looking at direct anti-cancer agents. Obviously, combination therapies have been a very important aspect of, of cancer drug discovery and therapeutic use since the advent of the first clean therapeutic agents. Again, we can integrate activities and, and different assays. So just looking at checkpoint inhibitors, we can look at functional assays. I talked about some of the assays we have for that. We have things that looking at uh, things like MLR, the Biomap platform, obviously, and then going into things like mouse syngenetic models, where we can model the effect there. One thing to not lose track of the fact is that ultimately cancer drugs are inherently toxic by, by their own right. And in fact, one of the biggest uh, sources of failure in clinical trials is where toxicities that were unexpected uh, that, that are seen. And this is not just for oncology. Um, we only have a certain number of assays in the industry that evaluate a certain number of targets that are identified as, as safety targets. But when one looks from a phenotypic perspective at how one might model human tissue disease and biology, especially if has, one has the ability to benchmark those activities against a variety of agents that are either succeeded in clinical trials or in some cases failed, we can learn a lot from that. And so by using things like the Biomap platform that are complex co-culture models, we can then begin to evaluate some of those potentially unseen toxicities by correlating activities with cases in the past where we have seen specific failures. So the attrition funnel is obviously designed to identify fewer compounds or fewer uh, potential drugs that have a greater chance of clinical success. So if we're clever in the way that we put assays together and we use them in an intelligent manner, we have a much greater chance of de-risking hits uh, and, and agents that go forward for clinical development. One aspect of Biomap actually that is important for that is what we call our toxicity signature analysis. So because I've mentioned uh, the, the, the Biomap platform can model a wide variety of different tissue biologies. We can use these as they're still an in vitro cellular model, but they are an extension on some of the other more simplistic cellular safety models that we have. So these get to providing uh, analyses that are highly translational and thus highly relevant from a clinical perspective. Ultimately, we can go into in vivo models, and so we actually have a, a, a partner lab, Pharmacology Discovery Services, based in our site in Taiwan. And Pharmacology Discovery Services offer a, a range of different human tumor types. Traditionally, straight xenografts have been uh, uh, the mainstay of oncology drug discovery, but obviously with the, in, the, the advent of immuno-oncology agents, Syngenetic models in, in, in mouse models have become important. We offer a variety of different formats here. And then ultimately, we can evaluate a range of different therapeutic types or different strategies, for example, epigenetic inhibitors that may themselves be designed to modulate key oncogenes or protax strategies. So we can evaluate all of these in, in the in vivo models, having pre-evaluated them in some of our more, more advanced uh, in vitro models. We can also look in those in vivo models at things like um, tumor immune cell responses. So again, relevant to uh, immuno-oncology here to see what agents are doing to the immune cell component in the tumor. We can also look at aspects of tumor biology that, that reflect the pharmacodynamic 
uh, approaches are of using a drug by looking at biomarkers. Does the drug get into the tumor? When you've got PK, when it's in the tumor, does it do what it's supposed to do? So if we, we wrap up now, we look at developing safe, more safer and effective models uh, of uh, developing more effective drugs. It's really a process of going from screening through a variety of different assays to ultimately uh, measuring effects on efficacy, safety, superiority to what's in, in, in standard practice. One has to remember that ultimately phase three trials a particular agent is evaluated against the standard of care for a particular disease. But the goal is not only approval, but clinical adoption. So really one needs to be able to show that a drug has activity and is superior. And that comes back to the overall goal that we have of developing better, safer, more efficacious drugs. Obviously, Eurofins is a very large CRO, so we have a wide uh, array of different uh, services, different assays, different products that support uh, just about every aspect of drug discovery. So we have a wide range of assays that we can draw on, a wide range of experience. And although we are large, we treat every, pro every project uh, as an individual drug discovery program. I'm sorry. Um, and so we, we, we provide, we, we treat each uh, uh, study and, and each particular program with the scientific integrity and detail that it deserves. But in fact, if there is the need to put together more complex drug discovery programs, we do have the ability to do that. As I mentioned, we have significant numbers of people who have experience in leading drug discovery programs, and we can assist you in putting together assays and filters and critical paths that make those important and intelligent decisions in getting you to, towards developing better medicines for treating cancer. As I've mentioned, we have expertise in a wide range of different platforms and technologies. And we also have tremendous experience across a wide range of different applications. We've worked with small startup companies right the way through to large pharma. We've worked with academic organizations as well as nonprofit organizations government agencies, including regulatory agencies, all of which are invested in developing better cancer drugs. So with that in mind, then we are ready, willing and able to be a part of your drug discovery team to apply our collective expertise together that we can develop much better and safer medicines for treating cancer. So with that, I'd like to thank you all very much for the opportunity to speak and for your attention today. Uh, if you'd like to contact us, uh, my contact information is here, as well as Eurofin's key contact information, as well as that for our key distributor in Korea, Cheon Laboratories. Uh, they, they are an excellent resource. And so with that, I thank you all very much.